wanted to talk about military surplus firearms. It's something that I keep getting advertisements for. It's something that I own. Um, it's something that you're probably going to see kicking around. There was a lot of them that flooded the market in the last couple of years. And with the missing amount of firearms on the market right now because everyone's buying everything, a lot of these are being snapped up and sometimes by people who don't really know or kind of get duped. Um, so I'd like to talk about that a little bit today because I, it's, it's, a, it's a rough world to be into, the, the military surplus stuff, but it can be extremely rewarding. So I'd like to go over some of the things to look for, some of the runs you might see, some of the things you might not see, uh, some ways to avoid being ripped off, um, and why or why not to get into surplus arms. First, I'd like to thank a certain gentleman who uh, supplied some of these firearms we're looking at today. Some of them are mine, some of them are his, and uh, you know who you are, so thank you very much for helping us make this video today. So, when you're buying military surplus, uh, generally that refers to stuff from World War I to the 1960s, uh, a lot of mass-produced firearms, mostly rifles, sometimes handguns, and some of these were made into millions, some of these in the hundreds of thousands, and it spans a, a pretty large area, and that's what makes it so attractive. There's so many different things there. There's, there's just a lot of it out there. Um, for instance, we'll take this uh, this Enfield right here. Yes, I know it's been modified. We'll talk about that later. This is an Eddie Stone 1917 uh, Enfield. There were somewhere around 3 million of these made. Uh, this happens to be a Mosin Nagant. Somewhere around 37 million of these were made. So there's a lot of them out there, uh, which is why you're probably running across them. So... When you're getting into military firearms, especially the surplus stuff, you really have to do your homework and be diligent. I've had some very good luck with it, but I've also seen people who've had bad luck. Right now, there's a lot of Mausers uh, that have been dumped on the market. They're getting snapped up because they are a very accurate rifle, especially for hunting purposes. This is a K98 that has been put into a very nice stock. Um, it's an extremely accurate firearm. Always has been, always will be. And it's, uh, it's, it's, very, it's very nice to shoot. So you're going to see a lot of these that have been modified, especially used. Um, some of these are original. This is uh, an 03 A3 in the original stock configuration. This one has been modified, and this Mosin Nagant is an original configuration. There are a lot of things you have to look for. Uh, one of the main ones you're looking for, especially if you're looking for a firearm to hunt with or to be accurate, is what's called when the barrel is shot out. That means it's had so many rounds down it or it's been scrubbed out so hard, or so many corrosive chemicals have been used on the barrel that it's no longer the proper size. And that can be an issue. Uh, that means your bullet's not making contact with what's called the landing, so those are little grooves in the barrel that make it twist, which make it accurate. And at that point, you're just throwing lead down range and hoping it hits something. So that's, that's something you want to look at. Also, like I said, you gotta do your due diligence. Something like uh, an 03 A3, some of them were produced with only two landings. That's much less accurate than five because you're getting much less surface contact. And another thing to really look for is variances in caliber. Uh, and, and this is great. So, so right here, we have a 1917 Enfield, an Eddie Stone. These were originally produced, these were originally produced in the British 303 Enfield round. Now what happened is, they were producing those during World War I, shipping them to the English, and then we decided to enter the war, and they said, oh no, what do we do? We don't have enough firearms. Well, over at Eddie Stone, they said, well, we got all these Enfield rifles, why don't we just ram a reamer down the barrel, make it a different size, and we'll chamber it to our .30-06 cartridge. And the army went, yeah! So there's a lot of those. Um, now this one, even further, was modified. Not just has someone painted it, they've also cut off the stock, removed the top piece, and then something else was done to it that was very common with a lot of surplus firearms. It was reamed out and the bolt face was changed in order to take what's called 300 wind mag, which is a much larger and more powerful cartridge. I'll show you those here in a minute. So these are three of the calibers that you may see these in. Luckily, on the side of the of the barrel here, it is stamped 300 win, so we have a pretty good idea on that. So from your left, my right, to my left, your right, we'll start with the 303 British, we 
which was the original chambering. Then we have the U.S. Military 30-06, and then over here finally we have the 300 Win Mag, and you can see there's a lot of difference in the amount of powder and capacity in these. This is a very hot round. This is just to show you can't you can't just say okay, well it's a 1917 Enfield, it must be in 303, because not only were they produced in many different calibers. Sometimes they were changed by competent gunsmiths, and sometimes they weren't so competent, so really check them over. Anything that's been modified, you really should take to a gunsmith. So another thing to look for is safeties. On these old guns, especially these bolt guns, most of the safeties, if they existed, were pretty awful. Um, here on the Eddie Stone, it's a simple old Enfield safety. That one's kind of nice. Now here, on any of these Mauser-style actions, what you have is a little tag here. Now, on the O3s and the A3, O3, A3s, and O3s, you have to pull the bolt back, which takes quite a bit of force, and then flop this little lever over, and then release it and put it back to fire. Um, on the Mose and the Gaunt, it's almost impossible. You have to really pull this back and twist it, and then it has to be cocked when you do this, and once again, it's cocked, and then you gotta reef on it and pull it backwards. Don't recommend using it. Uh, the Mauser type, this is a K98. It's pretty easy. You have a little tag here that just needs a lot of force. Over and you're safe. So they're not the easiest safeties to use in the world, but they do exist. Uh, some of them have been taken off, some of them are no longer functional, some of them, you know, uh, for instance, this Zastava, which we have discussed in other videos, it does have an aftermarket safety, but original military surplus had none whatsoever. There was no safety at all on these. So that's another thing you have to watch. If you're really concerned with safeties, you, you may want to rethink this or make sure that yours is functioning really well. Another thing you're going to see in these old bolt guns that is not common anymore is when you run empty, it locks open. So what happens is the follower in the magazine comes up far enough to block the bolt from going back in. Which means that an untrained soldier who hasn't counted his rounds goes, uh-oh, I'm out of ammunition, and he knows to put more in. However, for hunting purposes, especially if you're shooting single shot, it's kind of annoying. Uh, a lot of them have ways to turn that off. Some do, some don't. This one does not. So that's another feature that you're going to run into on a lot of these old bolt guns. The other thing is limited capacity. Most of these hold five rounds. Uh, the Enfield, I believe, holds six. You know, so that's that's something you have to look at. It's okay, these are almost all internal magazines. Enfields, you will see with removable box magazines, but they still weren't used a lot. Instead, what was used what was called stripper clips or charger clips. Uh, I believe all of these have it. If you could show the top of this. So you'll see there's a small chamber in here where a strip full of rounds will slide down in and rest against. You push all the bullets down off of the strip into the internal magazine, pull out your clip, and send it home, and you're now fully loaded. Uh, the other thing is taking the magazines apart on these. Most of them, it's, it's kind of a bear. You know, you're going to need a screwdriver. The other thing is they are heavy guns. Because they are heavy guns, and most of them are chambered in large 30 caliber, it does soak up some of the recoil, which is kind of nice, other than this monster here, which is extremely light and in 300 wind mag, and it hurts. Uh, so those are some of the, the key points to these military surplus rifles, and these are just a few you're going to run into. So once again, uh, just to illustrate some points, uh, things to look for on this, you know, you want to look for is there cracks in here? Is there a lot of rust? Is it is it a lot of drag marks? Uh, basically, you want to look for something that's in good condition. If it's not in good condition, well, you might get a deal. You might also get a dud or something that may explode. Like I said, if you're unsure, take it to a competent gunsmith. Uh, another thing that a lot of these have in common, almost all of these do, is in here you'll have a small hole that's been drilled for storing oil bottles and things like that. You know, I usually keep matches in an extra round in all mine. So, they also have very hopeful sights. 
Uh, for instance, ladder sights are not uncommon, adjustable sights of any kind. You can see this one, <laughs> this one goes all the way up to uh, about 1,600 yards. If you can hit something at 1,600 yards with this rifle, God bless you. Uh, the other thing is, once again, if these have been altered in any way, these original sights probably aren't going to do you any good. Uh, so you're better off figuring it out on your own or possibly buying aftermarket sights, depending on how you feel about it. But those are, those are some things that you'll see with that. Uh, so this is a K98, you know, the ubiquitous German Mauser. We've seen it in video games, movies, everywhere. It is a fantastic hunting rifle. Uh, this one has been put in a better stock, uh, makes it a little more comfortable. No steel butt plate, so it doesn't hurt quite as bad. Uh, and it's, it's a fine firearm. Now, as the war progressed, some of these got less and less good. So earlier and pre-war ones were a little bit better, and like anything else, war production, they look for ways to make it cheaper, easier to produce. Uh, right now there's a lot of Argentine Mausers on the market. They got dumped, from what I understand. Uh, a lot of other Mausers from other countries. One of the things you have to be aware of with Mausers is, number one, they're not all made of the same specifications. However, this is a very robust action. You're going to be safe. But number two, Depending on where it was made and by whom, it could be in a completely different cartridge. So it's it's one of them things you really have to be sure of, really do your homework and your due diligence, because if you put the wrong round in this, uh, you're going to have a bad day, and and you don't want to you don't want to have that bad day. So once again, if you're unsure, take it to a gunsmith. They can swedge the barrel and find out exactly what it is, or they may be able to pull it up from the marks. For instance, almost all of these old military firearms have proof marks or serial numbers or something all over them. Um, so you can usually find a lot, like this little CE here, which you can't see in the light here, that just signifies it was made by Sauer and Sons. And down here, 44 was made in 1944. But you, you rule, once again, you have to do diligence on that because some of these marks don't make sense and some of them aren't in English. So this is the Mosin the Gun, which you're going to see a lot of. Somewhere in the tens of millions of these were produced in multiple different variances in multiple different countries. Uh, I mean, it, it started its service life in like 1897, and the round that it fires is still used today. So this is not a bad buy if you can find one that's in good shape. The round that it shoots, the 7.62x54, is the equivalent to the US 30-06. And it is still used today in Russia and in other countries as a specialty sniper and squad support weapon round. So the round is not going anywhere. You will be able to find ammunition for this, unlike, say, 7mm or 8mm Mauser or 6.5 Swedish. Uh, so that can be found. Once again, you've got to check, is the barrel shot out? Did some poor Soviet soldier who couldn't read forget to clean the rifle when he should have? and the corrosion from the old primers destroyed the barrel. Uh, would, did they only cut one lug instead of two because it was made while the Soviets were, you know, being bombed by the Luftwaffe? You don't know. So you really have to dig in and really do some looking on it uh, before you buy them. You are going to see these everywhere. Um, there's a lot of them that have been modified. You will see those kicking around, you know, put into new stocks, specifically Archangel stocks. Some people have cut off this... Uh, 90 degree bolt handle and changed it, you know, put it to a more uh, American style rather than straight out to the side. Uh, the sights have been changed, some of them have been tapped for scopes. Once again, there were so many made that there's just so many variances out there, so really look at it before you decide on a purchase, you know. I mean, I don't want to see anybody waste their money. Uh, but like I said, you're going to see a lot of these, especially out at the gun shows, just because so many were made. And, you know, if you can get a $300 hunting rifle, great. Uh, another issue that a lot of people have with shooting these, they think it's the gun, but it's actually the ammunition. Let me show you that. Ammunition can make all the world of difference, especially in these old guns. You know, some of them were designed specifically for one certain round, and sometimes the rounds were not the best for that rifle. So when it comes to the 7.62x54R, this is what you're going to see most of the time. Uh, this is a, a Soviet cartridge. This is a steel core. It's, I mean, it's Soviet, so, I mean, you know, whatever. It is what it is. Now, this is a modern PPU, 
and this is 150 grain and it's a soft point and these are made specifically for hunting. Uh, so basically it's 150 grain aught six ish. You're going to get better accuracy from these or from hand loads than you are from this old Soviet stuff in some guns because of the barrel and, and just because some of them have personality. And once again, depending on when it was made, I mean, I've seen boxes of this old Soviet ammo that was made in the 1930s. Some of it's not going to be very good by today's standards, whereas this PPU stuff might have come out of a factory yesterday. So that's one of the things that can affect your accuracy and can really be important when you're, when you're discussing that. Uh, for instance, there's some U.S. rifles that were specifically designed around a very specific 30 6 cartridge and sometimes do not perform well with other ones. However, I have found that sometimes they perform better with the heavier rounds. So that's, that's just one of the things to look for when you're doing surplus buying. There's some things you're going to see on these you're not used to seeing. For instance, this little little thing here. This isn't for your your sling. This is actually so you can take three of them, lock it together, and make a tripod so your muzzle's out of the mud. Um, that's, I don't know why, but that's what they did. If you are in color guard or anything like that, you've probably run into one of these because they are so well balanced. I know a lot of people use these in their, their twirling. Um, this is an original stock. You will see a lot of these in Monte Carlo stocks or more modern stuff. Um, and once again, it suffers from a lot of the same failings of those old military rifles. But if you're okay with that, it's great. And once again, this is one of the ones you have to watch. You know, how, how long was this shot for? You know, how badly was that barrel shot? You know, did, did it spend two years in Europe being constantly fired? Or did it sit in some armory somewhere in the New York docks where it never saw action and was packed in grease? That's the basics on a lot of these old bolt-action military surplus. Uh, a lot of the things I've discussed today also can be used for what's called police trade-ins. That's where literally departments dump guns they don't want or they're not going to use anymore on the market and they're resold to civilians. And that can vary all the way from ARs to I've literally seen police buybacks that are uh, tourist judges. Some of them, once again, have been shot for thousands of rounds. Some of them have never been out of the holster. So you really, really got to kind of know your way around it, do your homework. And if you do, you can find that buying surplus can be extremely rewarding and like I said, you can get a functioning and fine 100 yard or more uh, Mosin Nagant hunting rifle, if that's what you want to do with it, that's your business, for $300 versus, you know, $1,000 for something like this 03A3. Now, in modern days when, you know, TC is making uh, bolt action rifles that are very good for three, four, five hundred dollars $500, you know, you, you got to weigh that for yourself. But like I said, these are some things that you're going to see a lot of just because there's so many of them out there. Anything made during the wars, there was a mountain of them made. And like I said, a lot of this can also be put back to your police trade-ins. And a lot of people think, oh, police trade-ins, that's just pistols. Well, not necessarily. You're also going to see shotguns. You're going to see backup pieces. You're going to see rifles. You're going to see, um, you know, from their sort teams, their long-range rifles. And once again, look into it and really inspect it and go over it. I don't recommend that you get into buying military surplus by just walking in and grabbing a rifle and going with it because there's just so much that goes into it. If, if that's the case, if you're just looking to grab a rifle and go, I really recommend that you look at something more modern, made more recently because it's going to be a little bit, uh, it's going to be a little bit easier to recognize the flaws, it's going to be a little safer, you know, it's going to have a safety that is not a monster to use and it's not going to weigh nine pounds. All of these rifles, except the K98, weigh at least eight and three quarter pounds. So when you're pulling that around in the field, that's a lot of weight. Um, whereas a modern one, I mean, you're talking seven pounds, and it sounds stupid, but that does make a difference. Uh, the other thing is, lately in the military surplus world, I'm seeing a lot of Caracanos. I'm seeing a lot of Mausers from Argentina. I'm seeing a lot of uh, Ruben Schmitz. It may seem attractive to get a World War II rifle that only costs you $200. But here's the big problem with some of those odd ones. There's no ammunition for them. Um, there is still some people who shoot the Reuben Schmidt. That's a 7.5 by 55, if I remember correctly. That's not readily available here in the States, except in surplus when you can find it. And this is pandemic time, so here we are. Uh, the 6.5 Caracano, 
there was a time when it was available. I haven't seen any for sale recently. And don't get fooled like a friend of mine did into buying the 6.5 Caracano because you think, ooh, 6.5, 6.5 Creedmoor is very popular. There must be rounds out for it. They're not interchangeable. So like I said, this is something you've really got to look into um, and, and to keep yourself from being duped, you really got to do your homework. Because like I said, someone will tell you, yeah, it's in 6.5. And you go, ooh, that must be in 6.5 Swedish, or that must be in 6.5 Creedmoor. Actually, it's in 6.5 Caracano, and good luck ever finding ammunition for it ever again. So those are some of the, the points there. Some of these rifles were made for people who barely knew what they were doing, so they were made simple. Some of these, you needed specialized tools just to set the front sight. So it, it, it's one of them things where really immerse yourself in it, or you will get taken for a ride. Um, and, you know, that's that's... That's all I have to say about, about those old rifles. Um, and, you know, once again, ammunition being what it is, really weigh your choice before you buy something in an ammunition that may be hard to find. You know, this 30 6 I can find 30 6 literally at a grocery store. Um, whereas something like 300 Win Mag is more expensive and harder to find. And then we get into the, the 8mm Mauser, and that's even harder still to find. So... Like I said, really weigh your options. Uh, if I've missed anything or if there's anything you want to hear more about or, you know, any questions or if, if you've even bought one of these and you have something you want to ask me, please leave it in the comments and I really look forward to hearing from you. So thank you and we'll see you next time. Excuse me, dear. It's spinning, not twirling. You spin a rifle. <laughs>